Really nice to meet you. Uh, you're over in London. Um, how's it? How's it over there right now? What's the What's the energy? Jo jolly old England. Uh, it's a little rainy. It's a little foggy. Jolly. It's uh, what you might What you might imagine. <laughs> yeah, I, I love England. It's a beautiful place. How's the uh, the the mood of the country? Is there uh, a lot of fear and uncertainty and and confusion and doubt like there is over here in the states these days? Oh, absolutely. No, absolutely. Um, maybe, maybe even more so, you know, especially economically, uh, things have been rough since Brexit right. and, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people you might talk to who said England is done. You know, we were, we were once an empire world, world's <laughs> largest empire. And those days are long gone. Uh, we're just clawing onto relevance. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's moves to try <laughs> to figure out what the future looks like and nobody knows really. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, I've been reading the work of Peter Zihan who's a geopolitical, you know, futurist thinker. And it's been really fascinating to um, hear his perspective on like what, is, what a post-global order world looks like. And he's describing the global order being the, the Bre post Bretton Woods order that the United States kind of yeah. created in the world by protecting sea lanes, supply chains, and injecting enormous amounts of capital. And yeah. he makes the point, and it's and it sounds true to me that we have basically the United States has basically, with, whether they know it or not, has ended that right. We've, re, you know, we've decided to yeah. retrench. We don't have the, we don't have the wealth. We don't have the, the, mind space as a country to kind of like, be the global presence yeah. which protects all those supply chains and all that, all that old order. And so now you're seeing it starting to fray and reorganize. And yeah. Brexit was part of that. Yeah, I mean, there, yeah, there's a lot that you could say about that. Um, you know, we've we've been privileged to to live under Pax Americana for a long time, um, right. but things exactly. are, things are more difficult, especially since the, you know the 1970s and the Bretton Woods uh, global oil crisis and all of that. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, so you know, I, there's there's so many factors that went into it. I mean, some of those are just historical events. Like you know, I still remember when they published the letter from Osama bin Laden where they kind of laid out what he wanted mm -hmm. to do. And, you know, his plan was, I want to get America entrenched in wars that it'll it'll struggle to fight. And, you know, in many ways he succeeded. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, on top mm -hmm. of that, I think, uh, you know, there's this website, uh, WTF, happened in 1971. I don't know if you've ever been to it. And it shows how the world comes apart in no. 1971, yeah. you know, end of Bretton Woods. And you see, like, you know, inequality rises, right. productivity falls. Uh, all, by all metrics, things get a, a lot worse from there. And actually, my book, um, you know, my my explanation for that is really uh, it was it was the rise in oil prices, the creation of OPEC, um, mm -hmm. and the actual mm -hmm. shift in our in our uh, in our excess energy capacities. So you know, we have we have yeah. plenty of energy, but it, it's mm -hmm. nowhere as cheap as it used to be. And energy is really what um, right. you know. It, it's what multiplies human ingenuity, right? You can't keep the American machine, the American right. military machine, moving without that cheap oil. Yeah. Right. Right, and that's a, a really a, a, a key point that the Zion character makes. Uh, you would appreciate meeting him, by the way. I think you know, with your background, yeah. is that you know, really, what will accelerate the global disorder is is access to oil and and if yeah. if you can't if you don't access oil if you don't produce your own oil and america doesn't now because of the shale revolution doesn't need to protect its supply lines from the middle east then yeah. you have this massive reorganization of everyone trying to you know yeah. align with um whatever local sources of oil they can get or, or protected sea lanes and that looks very different than what we had in the you know the last you know 60 years or so it's fascinating. So what is uh, your, your economic psychology? What Explain what that is to us. Yeah, so I mean, economic psychology is basically uh, economic behavior. So how, you know, how do people behave, especially, and how does that interact with our economic systems? Uh, but my background's kind of a, it's an unusual mix. So I mean, I started uh, my career as an engineer. And, you know, I did a dual degree um, mm -hmm. where I majored in, in psychology, but I, you know, I took classes in econ and poli-sci philosophy everything really uh, and then in grad mm -hmm. school uh, mm -hmm. you know I cross trained in economics uh, psychology uh, data science and evolutionary biology went to Harvard did human evolutionary biology as a postdoc and then took my current position so I mean the book is you know it has a bold title a theory of everyone 
But it's really it, what it's trying to say is, look, every discipline's focusing on a particular area and scientists are often very focused on a single thing. But you have to do the engineering thing. You have to step out and be able to zoom in and out of a system. And then you can really see what's going on. So, you know, you're alluding to some of that, you right. know, uh, the role that energy plays, for example. Uh, and that crosses so many disciplines to try to understand that, right? It, it, it crosses geopolitics, it crosses human behavior, uh, it crosses economics, mm -hmm. you know, political science, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, just, you know, some longer historical examples, you know, the reason that, that I live in the country that once had the world's largest empire was cheap and available coal. So, you know, the Industrial Revolution right. kicks off here. And then, you know, Europe as a whole takes off, you get the great divergence and eventually other countries, once they access that technology and the ability to put energy to work for them, then you get this kind of great con convergence. Right now, we're seeing the opposite, right? right, where we're seeing this kind of decline. And it's exactly what you said, the countries that have access to, to cheap and available oil have a lot of control and people are aligning themselves as best they can. And other countries are taking advantage of that. Right. So I don't know if you've ever read. Um, uh, it's actually in Russian, but there's lots of translations and, and rewrites on uh, Alexander Dugin's Foundations of Geopolitics. Do you know this book? I do. I have not read it, but I think it sounds, sounds about time. Let's talk about it real quick. Yeah. So, I mean, so, so Dugin, you know, allegedly is, was, you know, one of Putin's advisors. You know, he wrote kind of Putin's playbook, if you like. And, uh, you know, his, right. his actual relevance is, is unclear, but it seems like a lot of his thinking made its way into Russian military training. And what he basically, you know, he has this mm -hmm. crazy idea about there are two kinds of civilizations, land-based and sea-based. So the United States is like a sea-based civilization. Mm -hmm. You know, Russia is more land-based civilization. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he, 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 he looks at the world and he says, look, America's military is too large. There's no way that Russia can compete there. Uh, but it is open to fractures within within its society. So if we can foment those fractures, like, for example, the racial divide between blacks and whites and other groups, mm -hmm. if we can foment that. We can kind of, you know, destroy America from within. And we can do the same thing in other places. So, you mm -hmm. know, this is 1997. He writes this, you know, if we, if we cut off Britain from the rest of Europe, this is critical. Like we need to, you know, encourage anti-European sentiment mm -hmm. because the axis of Germany mm -hmm. and Britain together is too strong. Uh, Germany mm -hmm. should be given power mm -hmm. within Europe. You know, uh, Ukraine should not exist. Eventually, we need to take that back. Uh, you know, Finland shouldn't mm -hmm. exist. That should be a little bit scary. So, I mean, if you look, actually, if you look at the, you know, the world since, you know, since the 21st century began, it's very much Dugan's vision uh, by similar. accident or, or was by he plan. the guy that yeah. Was he the guy that predicted that the United States would break into four countries kind of based on regional alliances? Uh, not to my knowledge. I don't, I don't, I don't know. If, I mean, he may have said that, but I haven't read there that. There was a Russian. Uh, yeah, there was another Russian who was making that prediction, you know, three or four years ago. It was yeah. a little far-fetched, but I thought it may, might be. That seems a little far-fetched. That's fascinating because you can, you, know, you can see. Yeah. yeah, you can clearly see how Russia has played that playbook extremely well, right? And, yeah. and uh, especially Absolutely. in the, you know, the different political elections and whatnot. Let's go back yeah. to um, economic behavior. I like to relate it to kind of this this massive green movement, right? And so this push mm. at a political level, um, both the United States and Europe, and you know at the global institutional level for green energy and invest in, in yeah. all that and EVs and whatnot. And yet, and yet, human behavior is saying, you know what? We just want cheap energy and and we want things yeah. to work, right? We want our lights yeah. to be on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so now we have Ford and GM. They can't, you know, their lots are full of unsold yeah. EV cars. They can't. They can't produce these cars. And then the word's yeah. starting to get out that, the, you know, the batteries and the technology in, the, in this green tech is actually far right. dirtier, so to speak, than, than fossil yeah. fuels. What's your take on the whole, you know, kind of green movement versus fossil fuels and from an economic psychology yeah. perspective? So, I mean, look, e EVs are, I drive uh, an electric vehicle, I should say. And I mean, I just love it in terms of its performance. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, but, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, how, how green they are depends on, you know, what you're using to generate your power. Like if you're generating a bunch of, you know, coal power down the road, then you're not really a green vehicle, right? Um, and of course, the batteries themselves, yeah. uh, you know, the degree to which they're recyclable are also an environmental hazard. I, I think, you know, there's a lot of ideology in the green movement that is that is kind of worrying. If you look at it, you know, there's various ways to analyze uh, the energy sciences. And, you know, I'm, I'm an outsider to this kind of reading it, but I can at least read it as an engineer. Mm -hmm. um, there are various metrics, and one metric that I think is really a powerful lens is what's called the energy return on investment. So this is the amount of energy mm -hmm. it takes to get some amount of energy back, and that is really a, a measure of your excess energy. It's what what you want is a is is an energy source that with very little you get so much back, right? 
and oil used to be like that mm -hmm. and you know through fracking and the shale revolution we're kind of the numbers have gone up again but when we first like in 1919 one barrel of oil found you another thousand barrels you know, in 1950, one barrel oil oil found you another hundred, and by 2010, one barrel of oil found you another five. Wow. Right, and so you know you can see precipitously wow. these numbers are wow. dropping, and and if you look at the other energy technologies that we have available, only a few really make sense in terms of those numbers. So hydropower, fantastic. If you've got fast flowing rivers, mm -hmm. use them. You know, if you're Canada, uh, go go ahead and use that. Mm -hmm. um, if you you know if you have uh, solar is a little bit tricky. It, it's got a, an initial investment. You, there's a fusion reactor in the sky, and the more efficiently we can use that, that's great. But of course, transmission is a huge issue. We don't have we don't, haven't solved the battery yeah. issue, so we we don't we don't have like so you can think of fossil fuels really as millions of years worth of stored sunlight, right? So you have the fusion reactor in the sky, right. photosynthesis converting to chemical form, and then compressed over millions of years into you know, hard rock, coal, and oil, and natural gas. And we mm. don't have that equivalent. Like, even, mm. you know, hydrogen isn't quite there. We don't have that. Um, it's really nuclear is probably our, our, our cleanest bet uh, in terms of future, in terms of right. our future. And, and there are great technologies on the horizon, small modular reactors, micro reactors. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, right. fusion, if we ever get there, would turn us into the first generation of a galactic civilization. It would be unbelievable. But, but even on the horizon, I think part of the, the yeah. challenges we face is... Um, the stillborn nuclear age had we had we made the right investments and you know uh looked into better better technologies there i think that geopolitics and the levels of, of global cooperation would look very different today bit of a long-winded yeah, answer to your I question i couldn't agree more <laughs> no i love it i, I you, there's so much we could unpack but i don't want to go down that rabbit hole but just to um get your perspective and why is there so much resistance? Was it just Fukushima, or is it is it is it money you know flowing opportunity money flowing into the other green techs? But why aren't we pursuing yeah. nuclear That's power a, in all its yeah. forms? Because it's so much I safer mean, now than it was you know when Three Mile Island or Fukushima. Blue. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, this is like an, an open question. There is no, there's no known answer at the moment. There's lots of speculation. So initially, I think, you know, the fact that it was a dual use technology, you know, with massive military applications as well as, yeah. as, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as, um, uh, uh, applications in the, in the commercial sector, that was a, that was a bit scary to a lot of people, just the awesome power that we had under a control, uh, and then the devastation that we were able to deploy with that. Um, Mm -hmm. Hangover from the hippies. There was kind of a movement where somehow it got tied up. You know these fears. Um, there, that drove a lot of it. Uh, a lag between the understanding of the safety. That, you know a lot of the problems that are they're actually solved. So you know in the book I you know I say look if you mm -hmm. to think about nuclear technologies today, thinking about 1950s technologies is like looking at cars or airplanes. Like you would never drive or fly. You know given the safety numbers back in the 1950s, <laughs> right? But today's cars are way safer. Right. You know they break on command. You know today's airplanes right. rarely go down. Um, and it's the same with nuclear technologies, right? Like the amount of waste mm. we've been storing it for years, uh, quite safely on site because it's so small actually, and it requires very little mm -hmm. radiation shielding. So you know when I visited a a nuclear power plant last year, for example, you know, I could stand next to it. And, and in the Netherlands, anyone can, you can go visit uh, their, their waste facilities and it's very, very safe. Um, you know, so there's, there's all these, yeah. you know, I think there's a lot of myths and uh, some of it just requires a little bit of public education and a shift away from that messaging from the, the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Right. We are know. you we seeing, um, are we seeing any of these more forward looking countries investing in now again in nuclear power because they they see what we were talking about earlier that oh, you know, access to oil yeah. might be a little bit tricky yeah yeah no absolutely yeah, that's interesting and you know especially where 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 you don't have it so you know china has something like 228 reactors under construction uh you know one of the challenges is that you, i think it's because of the over the this, this, the amount of regulation that emerged in the regulatory environment um plants are are mm -hmm. very expensive to build in the west and they, uh, you know, they mm -hmm. take a very long time, and they often go over budget. But the Koreans were able to do it cheaply on time under budget, and so they're they're doing the same thing even in the Middle mm -hmm. East, which is, you know, if the Middle East are building nuclear reactors, mm -hmm. I think that should be assigned to everybody, you right. know. Um, and yeah. uh, you know, in, in, in this country too, you know, where there's a there's a there's a push toward nuclear, uh, and there's a big bid, uh, and and I, I honestly think for Britain, where I live. Uh, nuclear is the future there's not much more uh, that they have access to since the north sea kind of dried up yeah 
since you seem to be well educated on this point, how far from a commercial application for fusion do you think we are? Well, what I will say is, you know, the joke is that it's always between, you know, next Monday and, and the next 30 years. Uh, look, I defer to experts mm -hmm. like Vaclav Schmil who say the earliest we're going to see it is about 2050, which honestly isn't that far away. Okay. Uh, I think, it's you know, not. I think people, you know, that's, you know, that's, that is a while away. Now, that's why I think nuclear fission in the, in the, in the shorter term is, is essential. And, you know, I guess natural mm -hmm. gas is a backup mm -hmm. um, uh, to solar. Um, but one thing that I am, one thing that is different is that there's several viable potential pathways and more investment right. in the private sector and the, and the public sector in a startup-like ecosystem that we've ever seen before. And that's right. very exciting because it means that there's quite right. a number of possibilities. There's a lot of branching chains, if you like, that might lead to viable right. fusion. But you don't know till you get there. Right. Yeah. Right. I'd like to, to kind of like shift focus a little bit to talk about your work with your book. Um, I have to admit, you know, my audience knows this, but um, I'm a longtime yogi at heart, right? I, I started practicing Zen meditation when I was 21. And then I went into the seals and, you know, continue my practice. Then I found, you know, martial arts, of course, a lot of similarities. But then I got into, you know, authentic yoga through a guy named Paramahansa Yogananda and Patanjali Sutras, you know, really understanding deep, yeah. deep, deep, deep dive and really embracing the practice. And so when I saw your last name, Mutha Krishna, you know, I immediately, <laughs> immediately thought of the Bhagavad Gita and Krishna and Arjuna's, you know, path. And, and you're an Indian guy. So, and then I saw the title of your book, Theory of Everyone. And I was like, huh <laughs> like i wonder how much your 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 spiritual beliefs uh have like guided your work yeah that you know no one ever asked me that question mark i'm, I'm glad you did um yeah so i mean you know i i would say diversity has been you know has been my life experience so my you know, my, my family is actually from Sri Lanka, which is, of course, a Buddhist country, one of the last homes okay. of the original Buddhism, Theravada right. Buddhism. My my mother's family right. were, were Hindu. Uh, my father's family are like Catholics, you know, back to like 16th, 17th century. So, you know, I, I kind of had this 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 interesting um, blend of cultures always open to me. And I think as a as a kid, uh, you know, I, I was always look, look, there's all these claims on the table. And this has got to be the most important question mm -hmm. about how we should lead our lives. And we should mm -hmm. we should all spend a pile of time, you know, and I looked at things like Pascal's wager, you know, which is like, do I believe in God? Mm -hmm. Do I not believe in God? You know, does God exist? Does God not exist? And yeah. my reaction to that, look, w when Pascal wrote it, he was thinking about the Christian God, there was nothing else on the table. But I think right. what Pascal right. is really telling us is that this is an important question, and you should be evaluating these options. And so, you know, right. I, um, I would consider myself a, uh, you know, a, an agnostic theist. So that is, as a scientist, I'm like agnostic it. about everything. I've got no idea what the world, you know, the reality of the world is. Did the Buddha see something that the, we, the rest of us didn't, you know? What are the depths of understanding that, you know, that, that the Indus Valley were, were able to understand? You know, does, if there is a God, the great simulator in the sky, does he interfere in the world? Did he, did he pick a moment in history to place, you know, his son, whatever that means, you know, or, you know, this, you know, so I think in, in, I ended up, I ended up narrowing it down to, uh, in terms of a way of life, a very Buddhist detached, you know, this too shall pass way of living. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did practice mm -hmm. meditation for mm -hmm. a long time in the book. I actually talk about how I use, uh, flotation tanks, like isolation chambers as a kind of cheat code I, to meditation, yeah. you know, shut off all sensory input and yeah. you, your mind yeah. has no choice but to meditate. Um, you know, and I, I would say, you know, uh, I'm Catholic, you know, so, we, you know, uh, I think there's a lot mm -hmm. of richness in the in the in the blend of mm -hmm. not at kind of the at the kind of the level of the people, but at the level of the theology between kind of how science mm -hmm. and, and 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 spirituality kind of go hand in hand reason, you know, I think it's John Paul II who said, you know, reason mm -hmm. and, uh, and and faith, the two wings by which we fly, there are more, you know, there are more craters on mm -hmm. the moon named after Jesuit scientists than any other group. So there's a very long tradition there, <laughs> and you know, um, and I, you know, there's other interesting claims as well. You know, the Baha'is, for example, that's an interesting one. You know, the claim that actually in mm -hmm. each moment, whatever, whatever the, if there is a God, you know, he he releases in each moment these individuals or people. You know, the Krishna, uh, the Buddha, you know, uh, Jesus, whatever, and these are manifestations. That's an interesting claim. 
Um, you have to look at look at the details. Maybe that should be my next book. So I think you know everything I talk about in the book is really <laughs> trying to explain in a very a secular way, really, because you know I don't want I don't want to commit mm-hmm. anyone to any beliefs. But a lot of I think what we discover, especially when it comes to the evolution of religion, aligns. So you know in the book I talk about higher scales of cooperation, working together in cohesion and coordination mm-hmm. at a higher scale is mm-hmm. not only a great secular ambition, you know, a secular goal, but also one that aligns well with the teachings of the major world religions, right? You know, it's the mm-hmm. Atman and mm-hmm. the Brahman are one, mm-hmm. you know, it is uh, mm-hmm. a, a unified mm-hmm. reality for all of us, you know, it's, it's it, it aligns very nicely. And uh, so I think the, you know, mm-hmm. religion as it has evolved has picked up on things that help us work together better. But of course, every, for as I say sure. in the book, every scale of cooperation is also a scale of conflict. And so the, the trouble is when you get mm-hmm. to, you know, it allows you to reach this higher scale, but then you're in conflict with people who believe something different. And that's the great challenge of our age. And energy has a big part to play in that. Definitely. Because it's easier to be nice when there's more yeah, to go right. around. Yeah. Very true. I just want to double click on a couple of things. So you're right, like at, at the broadest perspective, you know, all religions are pointing toward the same thing. And, and words can only be pointers because, you know, words are rooted in duality this, that, up, down, man, woman, and source, Brahman, is non-dual. Advaita, which is the Buddhist tradition, means not to, so we are both and, right? We are that mm-hmm. and this. Yeah. But within this, this contracted human form, you know, you, you have all stages of evolution. You have the most depraved evil to the, to the highest form, you know, espoused in Jesus yeah. or or maybe even Krishna and Shiva, if they were actual humans, you know, uh, yeah. similar to, yeah. to the Jesus or Buddha. And so, um, and so what you said about uh, this movement globally through humanity to, be, to more cooperation, I, I agree with you because as individuals evolve along their scale of consciousness or, or let more of that light love, Satchitananda through, they generally become more loving and inclusive and compassionate. Yeah. And I see that, I see that flourishing on planet Earth as a, almost like a counterbalance to the, to, to all the cra- crazy chaos and violence that's going on. So I, I think humanity, despite what people read in the news, is actually moving in a very good direction. What do you, what sayeth you? Yeah, you know, I think so. For, from an evolutionary perspective, you know, it's not an accident that the major world religions uh, preach these things because it, it's almost like they. Any world religion yeah. that exists today is a religion that has enabled groups to cooperate and work together at a higher scale. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. There, there are other faiths, right. you know, and other right. traditions that existed. You know, uh, the Shakers, right? Famously, they were a, an offshoot of the Quakers mm-hmm. that believed in celibacy for everyone. Mm-hmm. They're not around. It wasn't a good. Fa- it wasn't mm. a good belief to have. It doesn't help <laughs> your group grow. It's not great for <laughs> for the human race. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So there's been a filtering process, I think. You know, and <laughs> these these religions are offering That's like cool. social technologies, if you like, that that and that that allow you to see something and and feel something maybe maybe more than yourself, and 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 allow us to cooperate with beliefs that that require us to kind of work together. And I think I think the what one can do in a, you know, in a, in a scientific world is to try to come up with a, uh, a life's philosophy that is consistent with the reality we understand through science, right? And when right. you, when you right. see that and you realize how much we don't know, it, it creates, I think, a lot of intellectual humility. You know, I think it was Heisenberg who said, uh, True. when you first drink from the glass of science, you know, you become an atheist, but at the bottom you find God. You know, it's, that, it's this, yeah, I love that. The, the more you know, the more you realize you right. don't know. And if we were peoples right. of the 17th, 18th, 19th century, we would think we'd worked it all out. And in reality, there's a lot more to understand. Mm-hmm. So I, I often think, you know, as me as a scientist, science is a, is a slow prayer as we begin to understand creation mm-hmm. and we begin to understand our world. And the more we understand, if there is a creator or greater reality, be it humanity in the future, the universe itself, a great simulator, a God as, as you know, as envisioned mm-hmm. in the holy books, um, we begin to understand that reality better by understanding the creation, by understanding the objects that humans make. You can understand a little bit about the psychology of humans, right? Um, yeah. So that, that's where I think the, you know, these things really nicely align. The more we understand, the more we understand ourselves and the more we understand 
any potential reality. Now, you you know, you said that we're we're heading upwards. I think we are, but I think there's also you know, in, in Christianity, there's a concept of original sin, you know, which I which I think one mm -hmm. reasonable interpretation of that is that a lot of our behavior we now understand is governed by kind of cultural software that we acquire from our societies, like mm -hmm. you studying, you know, the yogis and mm -hmm. so on, right? Mm -hmm. It gives you new mm -hmm. ways of thinking, new tools, new, new mm -hmm. realities. And it moves us away from a very conflict-based, zero-sum, animal way of living one's life. That's the original sin, you know? And so, you know, we live in a, in many ways, we live in a, a thoroughly Christianized world. You know, the idea, for example, that uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. If it was self-evident, you wouldn't have had to say that. You know, the lady doth protest too much. Like, it's a, it's a crazy idea, but it's, un, it's, it's, it's equal <laughs> under God. Like, if you look at a world of, you know, Simone Biles and, uh, you know, Usain Bolt's, like, this is not an equal world, right? <laughs> like, we're not equal, but we are equal in some sense, but only if you believe in some kind of creator. We hold these kinds of, we hold these kinds of beliefs. But, you know, I think there are greater things. What is it? The greater things in heaven than are, than are taught in your philosophies, Horatio, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. You um, you invoked Heisenberg, you know. So Heisenberg also, with the Heisenberg principle, said that you know we we affect that which we observe, and and then you line that with you know um, quantum physics, which says that we're you know particle can simultaneously be a wave. So when I look at that, I say, oh, interesting. Like the particle is the matter, the wave is the energy both exist simultaneously and wherever you put your attention if you're putting all your attention as a, a man strictly a material a, objective separate thing or a woman then you contract you you contract it into the into the matter form and and then and then the the dogma and the principles and the the you know thinking that you know reality and grasping for you know an a uh, belief system and then that leads to positionality and conflict Whereas if you can relax into the waveform of your life, which is energy or what the uh, yogis would call sat chit ananda, then you have life flows through you and you become uncontracted, open, free, and um, allowing and inviting. And it's almost like the, the yin and the yang. The yang is that kind of grasping outer and the yin is the receptive inner. And, and the whole you know, philosophy is that those two need to be merged. And even Jesus said that, like the, the masculine and the feminine need to come together in one. Anyways, um, I think that our, I want to relate this to our culture and economy. Like our economy is all masculine, all young, all linear. You know, it is the part particle side of, of <laughs> uh, science. And, and, and so we're missing that receptivity, that flow, that, you know, refreshing recycling energy of of life flowing through our economies i don't see how they can survive long long term i mean maybe 50 100 years but like i think you know and this relates to energy too you're going to see whole new systems arise which are circular economy and and allow that kind of like more of that life force through that you know i didn't articulate it very well but um I don't know. I think, what do you I have to say I, about I, that? Yeah, you know, I think, term, I, think like I understand Bitcoin, what you're Bitcoin saying. is probably a, a good part of that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think I think I understand. What you, so it is, I you know, it can be a useful analogy. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the, the you know the the reality, the interesting thing, I guess, about the va the wave function is that it is really neither a particle or, nor a wave. It's it it, it behaves as a particle right. under some circumstances. It behaves as waves, but it, it you know as uh, as Feynman used to say, just shut up and calculate. Like we don't know what this is, and we're trying to map it back to something that's right. at a meta scale. You know, we're, we're we're trying to map it back to something at our right. scale where we have particles and we have waves. But what's happening? at that quantum scale is mm -hmm. neither of those things we just have imperfect analogies right. and i think that's that's really interesting right and, and imperfect we often do see imperfect instruments to measure that reality exactly exactly like all we have right. are our perceptions right if there was if there was something right in front of us but that wasn't accessible to you know electromagnetism with which we see or vibrations with which we hear or chemicals with which we smell and taste or you know uh electrons you know whatever for, for touch um we would not perceive it. It would literally just not be there, right? right. It would, you know, in the same way the neutrinos are just right. simply not there. And, you know, and there's lots of dualities. That we, so, you know, when evolution first emerged, um, Darwin, you know, was a Victorian gentleman and he wasn't even thinking about, he wasn't thinking about women at all. 
and he was focused on competition as the driver of evolution and some people still think about that and you know actually there were many women at the time mm -hmm. um uh you know brown blackwell for example antoinette brown blackwell uh clemence royer you know who pointed out it's like you're missing the other half of this which is cooperation competition and cooperation go hand right. in hand right like what if you want to know the story of all of life or you like you are not an organ like you are not an individual organism you are an ecosystem you're the amazon rainforest there's a microbiome within right. you that you could not live without that's made up of billions of cells of of, of things that are not your dna right and we co mm -hmm. our greatest achievements and our worst atrocities were through competition but cooperative competition we work together to compete with others Right, so competition and cooperation are two sides of the same coin, and that this is all part of this kind of theory of everyone understanding these, you know, these mechanisms and how they play out in our world, and you know, so I think right. it's hard to know what what the future economic systems are going to be like. Capitalism has has worked quite well. I mean, it's lifted a lot of people out of poverty. I don't, you know, I'm mm -hmm. not. I, I actually worry about things like degrowth, for example, because what they what they artificially do is they create a a zero sum world. When growth stops, it means that inequality right. is entrenched. And, you know, that means that your win is my loss. And that incentivizes destructive competition rather than productive competition. And at the same time, you know, we live on a planet. Mm -hmm. So I think what we really need is the next era of abundance. We, we've reached these eras of abundance right. in our history. Agriculture was one. Well, fire was one. Then agriculture. The Industrial Revolution is the era of abundance we're now living through, the, the kind of shadow of that. The next era of abundance, I think, is nuclear fusion or whatever it might be. And that will enable us. It will give us the power to embody some of the things you're talking about. With enough energy, you can desalinate the water you need. You can, you know, plant all the forests you want. You can, you know, carbon capture. All of those problems of conservation and of climate change become a lot easier when you have more energy at your disposal, literal energy. And I think, you know, right. part of part of the issue as well with capitalism is that um, it's a system we've come up with. It, it has these nice emergent properties, but because it, it, it entrenches inequality over time and we don't have good leveling mechanisms, yeah. over time it breaks down yeah. because people fight over smaller and smaller shares as you know, pieces are captured. And, and growth is one of the things that helps you escape that. Actually, in the book, you know, I advocate, mm -hmm. you know, I advocate some, some ideas that might seem radical until you realize how recent they are. So income tax, 1913, that was when income tax first emerged and, you know, capital gains mm -hmm. tax at the same time. Mm -hmm. Right, it was one percent mm -hmm. up to about in today's money about a hundred thousand. Yeah. Right, and and you know it was seven percent at the highest rate up to like ten million or something like that. Right, uh, sales taxes nineteen twenty seven I think was when it first emerged. Right, these taxes mm -hmm. are what economists call distortionary, in that they cause you to work right. less. You know, because you don't want to enter that next tax bracket. They cause you to trade less because of sales tax, capital grains, and whatever. Mm -hmm. They're not good taxes. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. we should really be taxing, if anything, mm -hmm. is 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 Things like the land, so land value taxes, for example, mm -hmm. right? No, of all the assets you can own and use, the one that you did not create, so patents you created, companies you created, works of art you created, whiskey you created, you did not create the land. And so actually, if you look, it's one of these kind of secrets that's, that's supported by economists across the political spectrum, like dozens of, you know, like many, many, you know, uh, economists across, uh, like major economists as well as Nobel Prize winners, but we just don't know how to transition. So I suggest some pathways to transition toward get rid of all the other taxes, stop taxing that stuff. Even inheritance taxes mm -hmm. can be kind of distortionary and they're difficult to implement and people yeah. take their money with them. They mm -hmm. can't take the land with them. Like you can't take the land to the Bahamas, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so if we, if we uh, you know, there are paths, I think, even with a, with a small tax, let's say 3 to 6%, you can pay for the U.S. military, you can pay for Medicare, you can pay for the whole thing. But this is just, you know, all of these things emerge from this kind of theory of everyone. They, they, they suggest mm -hmm. the things we should be looking at that are preventing us from reaching that world that I think you're describing, that you describe so well. Yeah. What's the Enron effect? Is, is that, mm. well, I won't even try to. So, yeah, so the, the Enron effect is, is, is what happens when um, people don't understand evolution and they think of it as just competition. So, you know, Jeffrey Skilling, mm -hmm. uh, his favorite book uh, was Dawkins, The Selfish Gene. And from it, you know, he he, mm -hmm. he he understood evolution as just this competition. He didn't understand it was about cooperation as well. Right. Like you are a cooperative organism, as I said. Mm -hmm. You know, many cells working together mm -hmm. to be you. Um, and so what he did was he, you know, he, he wasn't the only one, but he was he famously uh, pushed forward Rankin Yank. 
And this was the idea that you would rank all your employees, you know, every quarter or at the end of the year, and then you would just chop the bottom, you know, five to 15%. You just fire them. Now, what does that do? It creates a zero sum environment. Many companies did, many companies did. And the more aggressively they did yeah. that, especially when there aren't enough resources to go around, it creates a zero sum reality, right? right? Because suddenly right. I'm now forming my coalitions. I'm trying to fight for my job. I don't want to be at the bottom, right? So, I'm, so yeah, it drives, but it mm -hmm. can only drive it up under conditions of abundance, right? Now you can contrast that with more mm -hmm. modern forms of governance like um, Sachin Adela, who's the, uh, the CEO of Microsoft. Mm -hmm. You know, Microsoft had a very mm -hmm. rank and yank type, you know, culture. And he said, look, we got to do away with this. We need to think about this almost as like a, an ecosystem of startups where you when you fail, you fail locally. But when you when you win, Microsoft needs to win. And it was through that that they made bets like mm -hmm. on OpenAI. And this same principle, actually, you mm -hmm. find it throughout nature and you find it in the best political and economic mm -hmm. systems in the world. Right. So, you know, Justice Brandeis in the United States described the U.S. as laboratories democracy for like democracy every state can try different things mm -hmm. let them all try give them the, the autonomy mm -hmm. to try that because if they fail they'll only fail at a state level or a city level or whatever right a county level mm -hmm. and if they mm -hmm. succeed it can be turned into you know it can be pushed up to the federal level and i think really one of the missteps in the united states was bypassing that system you know the attempts to yeah. use the courts or you know push things through executive orders without bringing everyone on board without showing this is the right path forward uh, you're, yeah. you're trying to bully your way through the legal system into forcing everyone to be in and that, that that leads to it, it breaks down this evolutionary system right it's why Silicon Valley works by the way right. same thing right like you think of Silicon Valley mm -hmm. as this kind of you know this uh, bastion of success Silicon Valley is a graveyard of failure right the, the, the MySpaces, <laughs> sure. the VTOLs, the Cools, it's all these companies you never heard about. Yeah. You know, many of those entrepreneurs should have taken a salary job at, you know, at one of the big companies, right? But the, <laughs> the fact that they tried, the fact that they gave it a shot, even though most of them were going to fail, meant that we got the Alphabets, we got the Amazons, you know, we got the Apples, we got those mm -hmm. few successes. And mm -hmm. at a country level, and I would say at a global level, actually, because the world benefited from it, they paid for the rest. So there's a hidden principle in there right. about how we align these mm -hmm. levels. And it's not just, it is about competition, but it's about cooperative competition, productive competition, where we work mm -hmm. harder to outcompete one another. And we, we, we share the benefits at some level through the tax system or just through the, the mere fact that these innovations can mm -hmm. be built upon. And we localize the failure, but we mm -hmm. don't fall so far that people are afraid to try. That's one of the strengths of the United States as well. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So the title of your book, The Theory of Everyone, give us kind of like the, you know, the three sentence elevator pitch. What What is that theory? I know we probably touched on different aspects of, of the vision. Yeah. And then um, what are like some of the most important pathways to see this come to fruition? Yeah. So, you know, a theory of everyone is a play on the theory of everything in physics, which is this grand unifying theory right. that connects, you know, the fundamental forces. Right. It connects uh, general relativity with, you know, uh, the physics of the very vast with yeah. the physics of the very small quantum mechanics. Right. Um, the mm -hmm. claim that I make is that, you know, those who work in this area now realize that we have for the first time this major revolution that turns the human and social sciences into a real science. Uh, you know, it's the moment when alchemy turns into chemistry because we now understand, like, Newton, he's a smart guy, but he's trying to turn lead into gold. Why? He doesn't know that the world is made up of elements, <laughs> elements that, that have patterns that fit into a periodic table and, you know, recombine in specific right. ways. And you can make gunpowder and you can make, you know, you can do all kinds of chemistry, but you can't turn lead into gold because they're different elements. We have that same understanding for humans and social and cultural evolution. And that understanding stems from the how we evolved, and I don't want to, you know, you can get into the details, but the, the essence of the theory is that hu what makes us a new kind of animal is that we are heavily reliant not just on genetic hardware, as every other animal is, and not just on individual learning, what we learn over our lifetime, but cultural software that's running on our brains that is evolving alongside us and that we acquire from our societies learning from the greats of the past who have filtered the best stuff over time and when a child is born the first thing that they do is catch up on the last several thousand years of human history and we do it through our schools we do it through our societies and a lot of the things you think of as being human are not they're in fact cultural so it's it, it's all mm -hmm. the way from um we have jaws that are too weak and guts that are too short for anything other than cooked food 
but we have no instincts for cooking or even fire. We like fire. We might have some instincts for liking fire, but we don't know how to make fire. It's kind of hard if you're not taught. All the way to numeracy, you know? So, like, you might think humans can count. For a lot of our history, this is how we counted. One, two, three, many, you know? And it took a long time to use stones or body parts. Yeah, it's true. It's true, you know? Uh, it took a long time to get it, it took a long time to uh, to understand like numbers and it took centuries before we could even uh, come up with the idea of zero you know you're talking about india as, as the beginnings of zero as a number and then zero mm -hmm. and the negative numbers that was until the 17th and 18th right. century when we came up with a number line a new right. piece of software that we could download like an app into our heads teach it to children and now negative numbers were accessible to us before that you know this is quote from in the book of from francis mazarese uh, this british mathematician he says negative numbers darken the very fabric of reality you know something along those lines he's like this is awful <laughs> he doesn't have the number line you know he's, he's not familiar with this but once you have that you're like oh okay i get it you know and then i can do the complex plane i can do all this other stuff so what we do right. we, we are a different kind of animal in that we we don't prefer what we see in the world we defer to the things that we learn from all of the people around us right and for example mm -hmm. Maybe two more examples, Mark, if you if you don't dodge me. You know, one is that people believe right. that it is germs that make us sick. And they ask me, what are germs? They're like invisible animals. I'm like, are the germs with us in the room right now, Mark? <laughs> you know, it's like you've never seen it. But, you know, the smartest people and everyone around you is washing their hands and behaving ways that are consistent. Now, if you if you were in the Amazon, you were in the Guarani tribe, you would equally have some evidence for spirits making you sick. And there's stories of anthropologists, you know, who said, it's the water making you sick. And they're looking at the water, and there's like, nothing's in this water. And then they start laughing at the anthropologist. Like, he thinks there's invisible animals. Can you see them? You know? Uh, and and you, even, you even ignore <laughs> your own senses. You ignore your own senses. So if I, you know, for most people, I know there's flat earthers, but if you look around the world, the, the, wor or the world looks flat for your perception. And, and the sun is clearly moving across the sky from east to west, right? But if I were to try to convince you of that, you know, most people instead believe that we're on a spheroid rotating around a star, one of many stars in the Milky Way. And, and to the best of my knowledge, that's true. But I personally don't have access to that. We as a collective, as humanity, have access. And it is through trust that we acquire this knowledge and even ways of thinking about the world. You know, it's, it's like you were saying, these great traditions, right. um, you know, they give you a new way to see the world. They give you a new emotional set, a new language with which to speak. That is the secret to what it means to be human, mm -hmm. the ability to acquire that software. So in the same way that if you want to understand, you know, pivot tables in Excel or chat GPT, you don't look in the, the CPU, you don't look in the GPU. It's not, it's not in the hardware, mm -hmm. it's in the software. Mm -hmm. And the book is all about how mm -hmm. to write that software, how to become more creative, how to become more literally more intelligent on IQ tests. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you asked me like, what do I need to mm -hmm. do? Well, the, 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 I, you know, I refer to kind of four laws that are governing this whole thing all the way from bacteria to businesses, from cells to societies. And they are energy and our access to energy and our ability to do that. Our innovations, and so the efficiency with which we can use that and put it to work for us. Cooperation, so how we work together and what incentivizes higher and lower scales based on energy abundance typically. And the forces mm -hmm. of evolution, both genetic evolution and cultural evolution, which is writing the software of your right. mind. And with those four, you can do you can understand a whole bunch of things and lay down a path to a better future. Fantastic. You mentioned ChatGPT, but it, it seems to me that we're on the cusp of an accelerant with artificial intelligence that can radically accelerate all four of those pathways. I and agree. what's your thought on, on AI and, and what it what it's gonna what it's gonna or how yeah, it's gonna no, I agree. affect us? So, you know, so I, I, I refer to AI as a fourth line of information in the book. So alongside, you know, genes, culture and individual uh, experience, you now have this ability to look across all that humans have created and find tailored specific information as well as find, you know, in that latent space, new discoveries, new scientific uh, truths. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's empowered as never before. So I think, you know, we used mm -hmm. energy and we used our technology to empower our muscle. Uh, you know, we, mm -hmm. we, can, we can travel faster uh, in cars and airplanes. We can, you know, build things faster with factories and power tools. We're now using that energy and technology to empower our minds as never before. The internet was the beginning. Mm -hmm. The fact that we can, you know, speak across the, the oceans as if we were in the same room, that was the beginning. Mm -hmm. The next mm -hmm. step is, is minds working alongside us, capturing this conversation and doing it in a kind of personalized way so, you know, I'm a, I'm a big data-driven 
you know guy in terms of life you know it's like the more data you have the better your intuitions are your gut your gut gets better mm -hmm. but a lot of the data that's available mm -hmm. to us is about the average you know what makes the average person happy mm -hmm. what makes the average person you know smarter you know more attractive but the average person is ironically pretty rare none of us is average the average is some imaginary right. middle person across all of these different dimensions that doesn't exist <laughs> And so that I, I don't care what makes that right. person happy. I don't care what that person makes that person money. I don't care what makes that person you know more attractive. I want to know what makes me happier, smarter, you know, more attractive. And so that's what AI gives you. It allows you to kind of in, by knowing you better, and knowing the data better, it can find you in that space and say, Mark, this is what you need to do to empower your life, empower your podcast, empower your spiritual. You know, you know, it's the it's 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 the points that you you talked about. You know. Um, I think that's one of the powers. Now, there's also a lot of dangers. You know, I don't want to downplay that. One of them is also just centralization, right? right? All these companies building on open AI technologies. Right. Open AI owns that. There's also Llama, you know, the open source version, mm -hmm. but it's not as good. It's not as it's not as, as mm -hmm. cutting edge. And so there's mm -hmm. a there's a there's a there's a there's a mm -hmm. concern around centralization, and there's of course a concern around how these technologies are used, because just like nuclear power, they're dual use, right? They could be used for right. our great achievements and 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 and, and our worst atrocities. And so actually what yeah. the what the book is also describing is how to solve some of the the legacy challenges like for example you know inequality challenges around governance um how we can trigger a creative explosion and how to, how to create more opportunities for more people things that are actually holding us back and are going to become worse in a world of ai if we can solve these problems ai will be a a blessing to the world Right, but we do have to solve some of those issues. Yeah. We, we, we do, do, we do, we really do. Yeah, I agree. I like that vision, and I share it. Yeah, but I do think yeah. there's going to be some rocky times in between while we, while it gets enacted. While we figure it so. out. Well, read read the book, and you know, while I mean, at, at the end of the book, I basically say, look, you know, if there's one central message, it is this, and that is that the world was made by people no smarter than you, than you and I, and in fact, not as smart as you and I, because because of you know we know rising IQ scores are we are getting more intelligent. We have better software than our ancestors did. Mm -hmm. The folks that you think about in history mm -hmm. stood out because they were the few that had access to books and knowledge when when many did not. Mm -hmm. Right? You have far more, mm -hmm. and it has always been mm -hmm. a small group of dedicated individuals empowered by by a, a set of ideas that have that have changed our world. It was always that. Right, mm -hmm. the you know mm -hmm. the uh, the suffragettes, you know um, the you know the Fabians creating the social welfare state here, you know the um, uh, you know the, the the expanding circle of morality of those we care about. You know, you can mm -hmm. you can see even words like you know the ones I mentioned earlier. We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal. You know this in this in the in the um, uh, you know the feminists use this uh, as uh, you know we hold these truths to be self evident that all men and women are created equal. You know, this, these were the words used by Martin Luther King Jr. on the, you know, in the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, where he said, you know, I'm calling on America to live out its ideals, where uh, that all men are created equal, right? Um, and so these ideas, I think, mm -hmm. when they're widely spread, when they're widely understood, and and I wrote the book, like I'm not I'm not showing you five different studies and saying, trust me, I'm a scientist. I want to show you, I don't want to tell you, I want to mm -hmm. show you how you can understand this. This is true about yourself, about our mm -hmm. world about where we're headed mm -hmm. and here's what we can advocate for and here's what we can do to create a better future not just for yourself but your children and every homo sapien to follow boom mic drop michael thank you so much for your time uh and your book theory of everyone who we are how we got here where we're going um you just want to send people to the audiobook or the hard copy or do you have any like, yeah, special I mean, website or you know, what, Google, Google is your friend uh, there is a there is a website that's localized to whatever country you're in so a theory of everyone dot com uh, it'll it'll point you to links where you can okay. you can check it out uh, but you know just Google it otherwise thanks so much for having me Mark I, I enjoyed this conversation now it's been a pleasure and do you uh, do any social media if, if uh, some enterprising individual wanted to reach out to you and connect I'm I'm on I'm on all the socials, so you can find me uh, M Muthu Krishna on Twitter or X now I guess uh, you know LinkedIn Michael Muthu Krishna Instagram Facebook if there's a social media I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, well it's been an honor uh, speaking with you, Michael. I really appreciate your time and and, Likewise, and congratulations Mark. on that Thank great you so work. Much. I can't wait to read it myself. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye.